wasted chewing gum bacteria. As I mentioned, it least appeared in scientific reports uh, like one year ago. But what is this paper about? So the first thing what they did was like asking a question. So uh, we were just surprised to, to, to see that no one before uh, had studied the microbial diversity in wasted chewing gums. So we all know that wasted chewing gums are a uh, contamination and aesthetical problem in so many cities because they are stuck on the pavement. Uh, if the pavement is light and the, the chewing gums become dark, it's, it's not something very nice to see. And we all know that it takes very, very long to, to disappear from, from the uh, ground. So what we did was uh, taking profit that we were on holidays like uh, before the pandemics and we were all traveling, at least I always do that, to travel with the sterile falcon tubes and we took samples from different countries of, of wasted chewing gum uh, stuck on the pavement. So we did that, of course, from Valencia, from Spain, from, uh, from France, Paris, from Greece, from Istanbul in Turkey, from Singapore, and there were other uh, samples that unfortunately didn't work well because they were taken from Indonesia, from Bali. Um, so, sorry, and this picture here shows the diversity that we found. The number of samples is not high enough to make correlations between geography and microbial taxonomy. But what we can already say is that there's a huge diversity of environmental, typical environmental bacteria there. This already suggested that chewing gums were not simply something inert there, but they were home of a quite amazing diversity of microorganisms. Uh, some of them can be found, of course, in other environments. And that no two chewing gums were, were alike. So there's quite an interesting variation. Another thing that we did uh, back, uh, back in Valencia was to answer a very simple question. So if you have a chewing gum, um, after a while and people step on it, etc., you get a very, very thin layer of, of this plastic-like gum or matter attached to the pavement. But even if it's thin, it might have like a couple of, or three millimeters. So the question was, is it the microbial profile the same in the surface of the pavement or in the inner, in internal part or in the one that is attached to the pavement? Because the uh, availability of water can be different. Of course, the effect of irradiation is very different depending on whether you are on top or in the middle part. And then what we did was taking just one, in, one chewing gum and slicing it, making like salami pieces of it, one top part, one intermediate part, and one bottom part. And to our surprise, they were basically the same. So you can see in these three histograms down there that uh, there are small faint differences, but basically the composition of the chewing gum, the, micro, the bacterial composition, is basically the same, which suggests the chewing gum is not something that is sticky and that attached uh, bacteria in surface because of its stickiness, but it's an environmental, uh, microbially an environmental environment by itself, and it has a relatively homogeneous distribution of bacteria and other uh, um, microorganisms inside it. After that, we, we wonder whether uh, the bacteria that we were identifying there could be able to grow on chewing gum. And in order to answer that question, what we did was uh, setting up a small collection of uh, microorganisms that we isolated from chewing gum and uh, giving them as the sole carbon source different compounds. So some of these compounds were uh, ones that we bought and that are uh, regular um, ingredients in chewing gum, for example, glycerol, aspartame, xylitol, sorbitol, glucose, sucrose, etc. And another thing that we did was preparing just the suspension of pure chewing gum that we bought in the supermarket and use that as a carbon source, uh, as a carbon source sorry, for the uh, bacteria that we were, we were able to isolate from old wasted chewing gums. And as you can see in this skid map here, many of those bacteria are able to use those compounds as a, a source of, uh, as a carbon source. And uh, in the petri dishes there, you can see that some bacteria grow much better when the, the, the medium is supplemented, for example, with powder, with powder chewing gum. So they are eating some of the components of the chewing gum. Of course, there is a plastic matrix there, which is very difficult to biodegrade, but the others can be used by microorganisms uh, to eat. Okay, um, figure A here shows the diversity that we found, the observed diversity, Shannon and Simpson, and basically it follows like an A curve uh, in which the diversity is maximum at the middle and is um, uh, significantly lesser at the beginning and at the end. But at the beginning, at the end of what? 
So what we did here was an experiment in Valencia, and I think this is something that contributed a lot for us to get the Ig Nobel Prize, because it's a fun experiment. So one of the researchers who did this, Leila Satari, the first author of the paper, she was uh, chewing gum uh, every day, and she was spitting the chewing gum in front of our institute here. You can still see the stains on the floor. And uh, then she was able to recover the wasted chewing gums after one week, two weeks, three weeks, etc. So we were able to set a collection of wasted chewing gum, uh, the age of which was perfectly known because it was us who made this and who put the wasted chewing gum on the floor. The first chewing gum was not put on the floor, it was a console one, and then we analyzed directly after being chewed by Leila. So at the beginning, we had the microbial community of her mouth in this case, and at the end, we have the microbial community uh, that had uh, established on the, on the chewing gum. Uh, this central slide shows the diversity, a lot of bacteria at the beginning, very oral, oral mouth bacteria, at the end, very environmental ones, and in between, the highest diversity, both of them. And the C figures shows a principal components analysis in which the classification of all these samples tends to grow according to their age. In other words, as you can see here, sample one, two, three, four, so the first samples, the ones that were uh, younger, that were just more directly related to the control ones, the recently split, form a group, and then samples five, seven, eight, etc. another one in red, this, and then in purple, the other one. So there is a clear relationship between the bacteria you can find in a chewing gum and how old that chewing gum has been stuck into the pavement. In order to see that more clearly, what we did was a very simple visualization of our results. So um, if you took the main, the, the four main uh, genera that uh, they are present in the control sample. You remember that the control sample was that one that was not stuck on the floor. It's similarly just recently chewed. So if you represent that, you get this uh, figure, figure A, in which you can see that uh, bacteria that are typical from the mouth are very present at the beginning, this is expected, and then they decrease in frequency, but they can be detected all, all along this 84 days assay. In other words, bacteria from a tumor gum are full of oral bacteria at the beginning, and once they are on the, on the floor, uh, their presence is decreased, but you can still find them. So they are very stably, um, at least you can detect them. This does not mean that they are alive, that's true. Um, in the figure B here, what we did was something, it's the opposite um, visualization in fact. We selected the main taxa that were present at the uh, last part of the experiment, so day 84, and we made this representation. And as you can see, some of these bacteria have been all the time there, but some bacteria are specifically um, increasing their presence at the end. And so some of those bacteria are Pseudomonas, Fingomonas, Acinetobacter, etc., which are typical environmental bacteria, and some of them with important bioremediation potential. What are the applications of this? This is a regular question that we got during the, the, the the massive impact that we had in the media, and this is something that the journalists were asking us all the time. So there are basically like three main applications of this research. The first one is bioremediation. So even if the plastic core of the gum is very difficult to degrade, if it's, um, at least partial degradation can be carried out by those bacteria because they are using the vast majority of the components of the gum, as we have demonstrated. The second is forensics. So we demonstrated that you can identify the bacteria that are typical from a, from a, for a, from a person uh, in the chewing gum that has been chewed by that person, even if it has been left for weeks or even months uh, on the floor. And it was done in Valencia in summer. You can imagine that. So it's extremely hot and the degradation of the DNA is not um, high enough to make us not possible to identify those bacteria. So uh, I, I explained bioremediation, I explained forensic, and the other one is uh, disease control. So if we were able to identify so easily those bacteria, I think it would be interesting to find out whether those pathogenic bacteria were viable or not. We didn't do that. And of course, there is also a very important research that should be done on, on, on viruses. We understand that viruses uh, do not last a lot on the environment, but it would be nice to 
uh, to see how long they can be viable and whether they could be transmitted. I don't think so, but you never know. Um, from wasted chewing gum that is um, uh, just uh, led there on the pavement. Anyhow, for obvious reasons, it's not a good reason to let your chewing gum stick on the floor, but you better put it in the litter. So who did that? The first author and the one that, who was chewing gum for a long time was Leila Satari. Uh, Alba Guillén, she created all the very nice visualization work and also data analysis um, in, in collaboration with Angela Vidal and then myself. So we were surprised when I got a phone call by Mark Abrahams, who's the guy there on top. And uh, uh, he told us that we were awarded an, uh, uh, no, an, an Ig Nobel Prize. He didn't uh, tell us what kind of prize it was. And then the, during the ceremony, we, we knew that the, the prize that we were awarded was the Ecology uh, Prize. And these are some uh, pictures that uh, we took or uh, a, a print screen from the ceremony in which the awards were given to us. Impact. So the impact of that has been massive. This is the first tweet that I made. And you know that in Twitter, you have this possibility of identifying statistics of those tweets, so the, the statistics of the tweets. So as many as 150,000 people saw that tweet, that's a lot. And 12,000 of them were clicking on it, etc. So this is an amazing number of clicks, uh, more than 1,000 likes, etc. So the, in terms of impact, this is an amazing impact. Then, uh, you, most of you are familiar with Outmetrics, which is a way to measure uh, the popularity in the medium of uh, scientific papers. So that paper of ours has a very, I don't we don't say low, but I mean average popularity was 45, I think, the day before we got the Nobel Prize. And just a few days later, it was 650. But look at the number there. So 447 people tweet that. That's a lot of tweeters. So 46 news, different news. Uh, we were on Wikipedia mainly blogs, etc. Et et so this is a massive impact on the media. This is just a selection. They are not all there of the new newspapers that uh, published our story. And this includes uh, Liberation in, in France, New Scientists, Biotechnics, National Geographic, and several times in El País, who uh, even made an interview to me that was one page in the, um, in the online version of the journal. So, this is an amazing, an amazing impact uh, on the media. Television and radio. We were in La Ventana uh, with Carlos Francino. We were also in CBS. Uh, that journalist there was giving the, the news of our chewing gum work from uh, South Africa. We were in La Sexta. We were with Joaquin Brass. We were in almost every radio, newspaper, and uh, television channel in Spain. And of course, we made a song in our accept acceptance speech. If you haven't seen it, you should immediately see it and watch it. And also, we had like 480 likes of this uh, speech that some people have said very kindly that is the best acceptance speech ever. So I, I guess that the next acceptance speech that we're going to give is also going to be a song, if, of course, my colleagues agree. So the waste chewing gum bacterium, lessons from the uh, Ig Nobel Prize. Novel versus Ig Nobel. One of the most common questions that I got when journalists asked me is, uh, would you prefer to have a Nobel Prize? Do you think you're going to have a Nobel Prize? Well, the second question is very <laughs> easy to answer. No, I don't think I'm going to have a Nobel Prize. Would you prefer to have a Nobel Prize or a Nobel Prize? I would prefer to have a Nobel Prize because of the money. So in the case of the Ig Nobel Prize, not only there is no money, but they give you like 10,000 trillion uh, dollars of Zimbabwe. That means nothing. So there's no money. But I have to say, honestly, that the Nobel Prize, getting that was an amazing and very, very funny experience. And having a Nobel Prize might be great, of course, for many reasons, of course. But it's a bit too serious, maybe for my, my character, at least. So research, serious versus funny. This is very important. Um, there is a bad thing about a Nobel Prize is that some people think, and that was my, my, my perception at the beginning, that it's associated with bad, bad research. But I was very surprised to see that 99% of the comments that we got and on the comments that uh, um, were posted on, on the news that appeared about us uh, were positive. 
So I think that most of the people are able to make the separation between something that is funny and something which is not good. But it's also true that, as the third point highlights here, impact on the media and opportunity for communication, every time that I uh, was interviewed, and I have given like dozens and dozens of interviews in the last weeks, I took it as an opportunity in order to make some fun at the beginning with the Nobel Prize, but then explaining to people that um, in our society, they are bakers, they are, uh, I don't know, uh, teachers, but they are also microbi microbiologists, people who travel with a falcon tube in the luggage in order to try to identify uh, the next uh, unexplored microbial environment. And I think that for uh, common public, it's very nice to know because there are things that they are discovering now within the COVID uh, pandemics, which is the word PCR. So everybody knows about PCR now. But PCR wouldn't have been possible without the extremophilic bacteria living in Yellowstone in thermophilic conditions from which the TAC polymerase was isolated and is currently, as you all know, used today. And this is a very interesting story that people understand uh, regardless of the information, that uh, looking on something strange like Yellowstone or uh, wasted chewing gum can have indeed very practical implications. And then KPIs, so um, quantitative data that change after that. And I am talking here as a very personal point of view. My Twitter account is mine and the other authors could, could of course give their, uh, their numbers. I got like 300 more followers in Twitter. My LinkedIn explodes. I have so many, let's say, friends in LinkedIn now who are interested in contact with us. Almetrics, it just uh, went from 45 to 650. Media coverage was, as I mentioned, massive. Old friends, some people that I knew for a while that were in touch with me from everywhere in the world. So this means that that information reached every corner in the world. And phone contests, and what I mean phone contests means that now in my smartphone I have like dozens of contacts of very well-known journalists uh, to whom I can be in touch in the future if we have something important to communicate. So all this, I think, in terms of communication, this is not science, we all know that, but in terms of communication of science, is simply priceless. And I think that as a take-home message, we can stick to this. So thank you very much for your attention.